I'm going to start by talking a little bit about arrhythmias. Now, arrhythmias is something which, if I'm quite honest with you, I didn't really get a, any sort of grasp on until about six months before my finals. Um, and then even then, a fairly limited grasp. And I think it would be fair to say it's one of the more complicated um, parts of cardiology. And if you just try and get out Kumar and Clark or Davidson's or any of the big textbooks and just open it, it's a bit of a nightmare because you don't really know where to start. Suddenly you're confronted with Vaughan Williams classifications and different types of AV block and Venkerback and all this kind of stuff. So what I'm going to try and do is just explain some really basic things and also give you some simple tips and tricks which will enable you to start getting in the habit of kind of pattern recognition, particularly with um, ECGs and with classification of tachycardias and bradycardias. So principles, that's what it's about. So first of all, when we think about symptoms of arrhythmia, um, often it's said that you know, palpitations is one of the core cardiological symptoms. Well, it's not really, because when you think about palpitations, you think about arrhythmias. But arrhythmias can manifest in so many different ways. And people can be totally asymptomatic. They can get palpitations. They can decompensate. So if a patient has ischemic heart disease, cardiac failure, something like that, if they then get an arrhythmia on top of that, they can then decompensate. So they get acute left ventricular failure. They can also get chest pain and low blood pressure. Um, if they get low blood pressure supply, supply to the brain, then of course they lose consciousness and get syncope. And at the very extreme, arrhythmias can also cause sudden death. And this is important because at the absolute basic level, the way we decide when to treat an arrhythmia is dependent upon two things. And this applies to all arrhythmias. Okay? Either this particular arrhythmia that we've identified is dangerous, i.e. it has the capacity to develop into decompensation or to cause sudden death. And I'm going to try and point out this evening the most important ones which are particularly dangerous. The other situation is where there's decompensation. Now, the four key things with decompensation are this. A low blood pressure. Now, that's kind of obvious. You know, if your heart's a pump, if there's an arrhythmia, it can't work properly, you decompensate and you get reduced cardiac output. That, if it goes to the brain, can lead to reduced consciousness. In patients with ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, particularly tachyarrhythmias, because they increase the oxygen demand of the, demand of the myocardium, can lead to acute ischemia and any of the acute coronary syndromes or just kind of um, angina. And then finally, if patients have heart failure, the development of an arrhythmia can lead to pulmonary edema. Okay? So those are the kind of four signs or four states of decompensation with arrhythmias. This is really easy. You can either have a slow heart, bradycardia, which is less than 60, or you can have a fast, which is tachycardia, greater than 100. Okay? I want to first talk about the tachycardias. Okay. This, if you take away one thing from my bit this evening, I'm not going to encroach on Rashmi's bit, it's this. Okay? We broadly divide tachycardias into supraventricular or ventricular. Okay? And what I mean by supraventricular is any abnormality above this line. So the most common places are with the sinoatrial node, um, the AV node, or with the, the conducting tissue within the atria. Okay? Now, ventricular tachycardia occurs below that. That's really important. Now, it's really easy to tell the difference. Okay? As a general rule, if it's supraventricular, the tachycardia, then it will have a narrow complex. So your QRS complex will be less than 0.12. Okay? If it's a ventricular, it will be greater than 0.12. And here's just two examples, okay? Narrow QRS complex, it's fast, notice that first of all. It's a narrow QRS complex, so this is a supraventricular tachycardia. This one, wide, greater than 0.12, so it's a um, ventricular tachycardia. There is an exception. There's always exceptions in everything, but the particular exception, and the one I want you to learn here, is that a supraventricular tachycardia, together with a bundle branch block, causes a wide complex QRS supraventricular tachycardia. And that kind of makes sense, I guess, because the problems in the supraventricular system, but there's an added problem of conduction within the ventricular system as well. 
Now, just in terms of bundle branch blocks, um, I thought I'd add this in because you guys will probably all be familiar with these mnemonics, Marrow and William and M and W. Okay? Forget about the W bit. Okay? The W bit on the ECG is an absolute nightmare to recognize. Okay? What you've got to remember is that the M bit is the RSR1. Now, does everyone know what I mean by an RSR1 pattern on ECG? Okay. So R is just a small positive deflection. S is a deep negative. And then R1 is exactly the same thing again, so a short positive. And as you can kind of imagine, if you trace that in your mind, it kind of looks like an M. Okay? So in your right bundle branch block, you get that RSR in V1. So then your M is at the beginning. And in left bundle branch block, you get that RSR1 in V6. And so your M is at, at the end. Okay, so just learn that. Now, importantly, if you have a bundle branch block, and this is the one thing you should try and remember about bundle branch blocks, it makes it very difficult to interpret the rest of the ECG. So if you see one of these bundle branch blocks, then you can't really comment on the rest of the ECG. You can't really say, oh, there's ST elevation, or there's T-wave inversion, or T-wave depression, or whatever, because it makes the interpretation, it makes the tracing, um, it's basically, it makes it look at a different way at the heart. So you can't really interpret it in the same way as you would normally. Okay, so just to say again, broad complex is usually ventricular, except in a situation where you have one of these bundle branch blocks and a supraventricular tachycardia. Okay. Now, the two ventricular tachycardias that you must, must know about is VT and VF. Okay, forget about torsades for the moment, it's not important. So VF is the most serious, and the way you recognize it is imagine a child scribble. Okay, so it's just a kind of Squiggly now, this is actually a bit too um, well made, this, this one here. It should, it's much more chaotic in real life. And VF is not really compatible with any sort of cardiac output. The, 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 the ventricles are just not contracting in any meaningful way. They're just fibrillating. So you get no cardiac output, patient lose consciousness, cardiac arrest. Okay? VF causes cardiac arrest. It's really important. VT, on the other hand, is like this. So it's ventricular, so you've got your wide QRS, and it's regular, and it doesn't look like a child's scribble. Okay? Now, VT can be pulseless. So you can get VT that doesn't have a cardiac output. Okay? But most ventricular tachycardias will have a cardiac output. So the patient will be unwell, but they won't be in cardiac arrest. Okay? If we now talk about the narrow complex um, tachycardias, i.e. the supraventricular ones. You need to subdivide those into irregular ones and regular ones. Now, the irregular ones you guys will be familiar with. It's atrial fibrillation. I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. But the regular ones you may not be so familiar with. Okay. First of these is sinus tachycardia. Okay, lots of different things, both physiological and pathological, that cause that. And the other important two are AVNRT NRT, and AVRT. Okay, sometimes you'll see AV, NNRT and stuff. Forget about that. Okay. AV, NRT, so AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and AV reentrant tachycardia. Okay. So this is just a little bit about sinus tachycardia. I'm sure you guys know a lot about this. It can be physiological, so caused by pain, exercise, anxiety, or pathological. And particularly important there is hypovolemia. It's one of the first signs of hypovolemia. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is explain what's the difference between an AVNRT and an AVRT. Okay, so the AVN, it's got the N bit in, and N stands for nodal. So the problem is in the node, is in the atrioventricular node. And basically what happens is you get um, an additional pathway in the node which allows re-entrant circuits. So what happens is your sinoatrial node fires, it goes down to the AV node, and then you get a local circuit where it goes down one, hits ventricles fire, it then goes immediately round instead of coming from up here and hits it again. So the ventricular system fires off again. So you get a tachycardia, and it just goes round and round and round like that. Okay, if it's AV reentrant tachycardia, which is sometimes called AV non-nodal reentrant tachycardia just to make life difficult, there's an accessory pathway that's a very low resistance. And what happens here is there's an, this accessory pathway here, okay, 
So when the ventricles, when you get an activation here, ventricles fire, goes straight back round and keeps on going round because it's a low resistance pathway. So you get continual activation of the ventricles from this pathway here. Now, the most important AV reentrant tachycardia that you need to know about is Wolf Parkinson White <coughs> syndrome. Okay? And in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, this little bundle here is called the bundle of Kent. Okay, you'll see that um, sometimes. And the, there's only two features you need to know. There's a short PR interval, and you get a slurred upstroke to the QRS complex, which gives the QRS complex the appearance of a delta shape, the Greek delta shape. So it's called a delta wave. And here's an example. Um, if you just look at uh, lead one, <coughs> you can see the, the P to QRS is short. And if you look, I think this is a good example. This wave here in V3 looks quite a lot like a delta. Okay, so just remember those two, those two features. You won't see it. I mean, the examiner would be very unkind. Your consultants would be very kind just to give you a uh, Wolf Parkinson White and expect you to, to recognize it. OK, does everyone understand that? Basic differences between AV, NRT, AVRT. Any questions? So generally, when you're treating these things, and this applies to all arrhythmias, okay? If it's fast, slow it down. If it's slow, speed it up, okay? And there are different ways you can do it. They generally are the same between Brady and tachy, but I'll talk about Brady in a sec. Um, with tachycardias, you can try conservative things first. And examples of this are Valsalva maneuver, carotid or ocular pressure. And this basically just increases the parasympathetic tone and then which can decrease the, um, the rate of firing of the heart and can self-terminate any of these tachycardias. Okay? There's two important medical therapies. Okay? One of them is adenosine. Okay? I don't want to go into how it works and everything, but adenosine is the kind of first-line drug that we use to terminate these things if the conservative measures fail. If the patient's unstable, and that's, if they have any of those things that I talked about at the beginning, remember the four things, that you worry about, then you shock them. Okay? That's when you need to act quickly. The quickest way to get someone out of any tachycardia is to give them DC shock. Okay, So quickly, atrial fibrillation. This is your atrial fibrillation. Remember the features you need to look for, irregularly irregular pulse, irregular uh, QRS complexes, loss of P waves, very important, and this kind of uh, baseline. You can't see it very well here but you get this kind of very fine fibrillating baseline, which is the, atrials, uh, the atrium in fibrillation. Causes. Favorite one, Monday morning, consultant ward round. What are the causes of atrial fibrillation? Uh. Uh, cardiac, non-cardiac is your best way to divide them up. Um, and the important two for cardiac, you should remember, are ischemic heart disease and valve disease, particularly mitral valve disease, because that's the closest um, valve and the most common valve to be uh, affected in the heart. And non-cardiac uh, causes, importantly, alcohol, thyrotoxicosis, and pneumonia. Okay. So those are the really important causes. Okay, so why is atrial fibrillation a problem? Does anyone know? Why is atrial fibrillation a problem? Emboli. Yep, that's not the first one. I'll put all of them up. Okay, so emboli, absolutely. If you have atrial fibrillation, your risk of having embolic stroke increases, and Rashman will talk more about that. Um, the other problem is if the atria are fibrillating, then they're not ejecting um, blood efficiently. If you remember with ventricular fibrillation, when the ventricles were fibrillating, there was no cardiac output at all. So when the, atrials, uh, the atria are fibrillating, there's very little um, added by the atria to the ventricles. Okay? And that's important because some patients can't cope with that reduction. I mean, as you'll remember, most of the filling of the ventricles um, is passive and doesn't need any actual coordinated activity of the, of the atria. But 15% is active, and some patients can't cope with losing that, um, that amount. The other problem, is, of course, is a tachycardia. As I said, a uh, fast ventricular response can increase oxygen demand of the myocardium, and some patients can't really cope with that. Okay, two important concepts in atrial fibrillation. Rate versus rhythm control is one, and the other one is anticoagulation. 
Those are the two cornerstones of the management of atrial fibrillation. Okay, so when we talk about rate control, all that we're doing basically is using some sort of drug to control the rate at which the ventricles are firing in response to the atria fibrillator. Okay, that's the absolute basics. However, if we do that, the atria are still in fibrillation and there's a risk of clot formation and emboli. So that always requires anticoagulation. Okay. And you don't need to know, but specifically drugs that we usually use, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and um, digoxin. Okay. Now, rhythm control is kind of, you think, a bit better because we actually cure the problem. So we stop the atria fibrillating. Okay. And therefore, we don't need anticoagulation. Um, and to do that, we either use drugs or we use electricity. Okay. Just like with those tachycardias, the supraventricular tachycardias, we can do DC cardioversion, or we can use drugs. Okay, and the two drugs here are amiodarone and flecainide. Okay, those are the two most important drugs. In terms of anticoagulation, say if we're doing rate control and we want to anticoagulate the patient, we use warfarin. And it's been shown that by doing this, we reduce the risk per year of stroke from 4% to 1%, okay? Some patients, because they won't go to have their INR checked or they're at risk of falls and, and potential bleeds in the brain, um, get aspirin instead. And it's not as good, but it's actually nearly as good. Okay, so here are the basic rules, okay? This is the management pathway, okay? Of if, if, the, if a patient has sudden onset of palpitations, um, they come into hospital quickly, um, less than 48 hours, okay? Their risk of having formed a clot within those 48 hours is very small. Okay, so what we do is we cardiovert them immediately. So a characteristic, char characteristic example which I've seen would be one of you guys who comes into A&E having been on a binge. You're in atrial fibrillation. Okay, remember, non-cardiac cause alcohol. We give you a bit of flecainide IV straight out of it. No need to anticoagulate or nothing, okay? The other option, if the atrial fibrillation has been long-standing, Okay. You either use rhythm control or rate control. Okay. So you can anticoagulate and then rhythm control six weeks later, or you can anticoagulate, rate control the patient, and then just simply be done with it, and they're on warfarin for life. Okay. I've gone through that quite quickly, I know, um, but this stuff's more important. Concepts of rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation. Okay. Uh, that's transesophageal echo. If you actually want to look to see if there's a clot um, in the left atrium, and it for usually forms the left atrial appendage, you can do a transesophageal echo. Okay, so finally, bradycardias, very, very quickly. Okay, bradycardias, there are two problems that can happen. You either have a failure of impulse generation, or an impulse that's generated fails to conduct. Okay? Now, you'll be most familiar with a situation where it doesn't conduct. That's AV block, and you've got, remember, your three types, okay? But impulse generation is also important, and the condition there is called sick sinus syndrome, okay? Basically, what happens in this is it's a disease usually of the elderly, and there's fibrosis of the sinoatrial node and the surrounding nodal tissue. And what basically happens is there's intermittent failure of impulse generation within the sinoatrial node, and sometimes failure of propagation, reflecting the perinodal fibrosis as well. Okay. And the most important feature to be aware of is very, very long pauses between um, P waves. So they'll be bradycardic, and they'll have a very, you look at the ECG and you go, oh, this doesn't fit into anything I know. And you look at the P waves and there's massive pauses in between. Okay. That's six sinus syndrome. Don't worry about the rest. ECGs um, for AV uh, blocks are really, really important, and it's really, really easy, okay? You've got first, second, and third degree heart block. Now, do you remember before I said that there are some conditions that are dangerous? There are some conditions which, even if the patient's not decompensating in some kind of way, we have to treat, okay? Now, the two, the two things you need to take from this slide are that Mobitz type 2, second degree heart block, and third degree heart block need to be treated, okay, with pacing. It's absolutely vital. The other ones are quite well tolerated and they don't need to be treated. 
I'm not going to go through each of them because it's something that you can do very easily, but just take that away from this slide. The severe second and third degree you need to treat. Okay, just like with tachycardias, um, if it's fast, slow it down. With bradycardias, bradycardias, if it's slow, speed it up. Okay, remember we use adenosine as our drug to slow it down. In the case of bradycardias, we use atropine to speed it up. Okay, now instead of cardioversion, um, for bradycardias, like in tachycardias, we use pacing. Okay. And we can either do that temporarily, either, either through putting in a central line and putting a, um, an electrode straight into the atria, or, or ventricle, or we can do it long-term by putting in a pacemaker, which tends to sit up here, and which you should have seen quite a few patients on. Okay? Are there any questions on that? I know it's uh, I really rushed through that. The time doesn't allow for much more. All these slides will go up. Um, on the website as normal. Any questions?